This is lecture 3J, and we're going to talk about the second and third colligative properties of solutions. Colligative property number two is boiling point elevation. Anytime a liquid has a non-volatile solute dissolved in it, that liquid will now have a boiling point that's higher than the pure solvent. And to understand why that is, we're going to go back and talk about what the definition of the boiling point of a solution is. When something like water boils, we form bubbles inside of it. And the bubbles can only exist if the solvent has an equilibrium vapor pressure equal to the prevailing atmospheric pressure. Definition of boiling point, solvent boils when its EVP equals the prevailing atmospheric pressure. The reason for that is if a, if a bubble forms, and this is what happens when a liquid is boiling, inside that bubble is vapor. In the case of water, it would be steam. And the only way that can bubble can exist is if the steam's pressure is equal to the pressure that's being pushed on the outside of it, the bubble itself. Atmospheric pressure pushes down on the surface of the liquid in the beaker, and that pressure is experienced all throughout the liquid, so it pushes on the bubble inside the water as well. The red arrows indicating atmospheric pressure, the blue arrows indicate the pressure of the water vapor. And if the water vapor's pressure equals the atmospheric pressure, the bubble can survive and so the water will therefore boil. At, at, uh, for water, water has an equilibrium vapor pressure of 760 torr at 100 degrees Celsius. And because 760 torr is natural atmospheric pressure, this is the temperature that water boils at sea level on Earth. So this is when water boils. Equilibrium vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. What happens to the water if you dissolve a solute in it? first colligative property that we talked about last time is vapor pressure lowering. All those solute particles in the liquid cause the liquid's vapor pressure to be lower. So with solute particles dissolved in the solvent, its EVP is lowered. We can represent that by shrinking down these blue arrows now. If the pressure inside the bubble is less than atmospheric, the atmospheric pressure squeezes the bubble down to nothing, and therefore no bubbles can form. So therefore, at 100 degrees, the liquid stops boiling because the bubbles disappear. How are you going to be able to make bubbles again? You've got to raise the temperature in order to raise the pressure of the vapor so that it again will equal atmospheric pressure. So if we uh, raise that temperature, it'll cause the equilibrium vapor pressure to increase. So let's change the temperature from 100 to 101 degrees. What does that do? That causes the pressure inside the bubbles to increase, but it's still not quite equal to atmospheric pressure. Raise the temperature to 102, the equilibrium vapor pressure of water will increase even more. And now if the equilibrium vapor pressure of water equals atmospheric pressure, the solution will boil. And now that's happening at a higher temperature. So the boiling point of the solution is now higher than what the boiling point was of pure water. If we want to look at this in a graphical sense, I can show the graph for what the equilibrium vapor pressure is of pure water at any given temperature. And we can see that there's a direct relationship, although it's not linear, that as the temperature goes up, the equilibrium vapor pressure goes up as well. And if we look over here at 100 degrees Celsius, what we see is water's equilibrium vapor pressure at 100 degrees Celsius is 760 torr. So that's when water is going to boil as long as the atmospheric pressure is 760. When a solute is dissolved into pure water, it causes the vapor pressure to decrease. So the entire vapor pressure curve for a uh, solution of water would be lower than this, maybe represented by this green line here. But it's still the case that water will only boil when its vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. So on the green curve, when does the solution's vapor pressure equal 760? It's right here, and that's at a higher temperature. So the temperature that a solution boils at is always going to be higher than the temperature that pure water or pure liquid boils at. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to quantitatively determine uh, how to calculate the increase in boiling point from a solvent to a solution. And it turns out it's a colligative property the change in the boiling point of the solution, which will be abbreviated delta T sub B, is proportional to the concentration of the solute particles in the solution. The more solute particles there are, the bigger the change in the boiling point you'll see. This is a proportionality equation, and we don't use those quite often. We like equalities instead. 
So I'm going to erase the proportionality sign and replace it with an equal sign and a constant. And so we can say the change in the boiling point equals a constant multiplied by some way to measure the concentration of the solute particles. Now, because we're changing the temperature of a liquid drastically up to its boiling point and down to room temperature, we want to use a concentration unit that will not change with temperature. So we're not going to use the concentration unit of molarity. The only one that doesn't change with temperature, or the major one that doesn't change with temperature that's related to moles of solute is molality. And so we're going to represent the concentration of the solute by the concentration unit of molality. So the change in the boiling point, delta T sub B, or we could be more specific and say the increase in the boiling point, will equal a constant. And this constant, K sub B, is called the molal boiling point constant, and it's for the solvent. And every different liquid that you make a solution with will have its own unique molal boiling point constant. Water has a boiling point constant. Benzene has a boiling point constant. Alcohol has a boiling point constant. They're all unique. The script M, or the italicized M actually, stands for the molality of the solution. And from the molality of the solution, we calculate the concentration of the dissolved solute particles, unless it's an electrolyte. If it's an electrolyte, then we know the solute dissociates into multiple ions per formula unit. And so we have one more term in the equation, it's I, called the Van Hoff factor. And it's essentially telling us how many ions a particular solute uh, formula unit will dissociate or ionize into. It's defined as moles of solute particles in solution per moles of dissolved solute. And so let's try to show where that comes from for an example with four different solutes. The first one, C6H12O6, is sugar. That's a non-electrolyte. Does not ionize or dissociate in water. So if you put one mole of sugar molecules in water, you'll have one mole of dissolved particles in the solution. So a non-electrolyte always has an I value of one. Magnesium bromide is an electrolyte. It'll dissociate into one magnesium ions and two bromide ions when dissolved. So therefore, one mole of magnesium bromide actually produces three moles of solute particles. Its I values three. Using that same logic, HCl is a strong acid. When that dissolves in water, it dissociates or actually ionizes into a hydrogen ion and a chloride ion. So therefore, its I value would be two. And aluminum sulfate is an ionic compound. When it dissolves in water, it dissociates into ions. And if you count them up, there'd be two aluminum ions and three sulfate ions when one of these formula units dissolve, giving you an I value of five. So we're going to do an example. We're going to find the boiling point of a solution that is prepared with 0 0.150 moles of sodium chloride dissolved in 90.0 grams of water. And to do this, we're going to use our colligative property equation, the change in the boiling point, equals the molal boiling point constant times the molality times I. On your last homework assignment, you were asked to have access to handout five. And if I take a picture from handout five, it contains information about solvents, water, carbon tetrachloride, chloroform, benzene, etc. The first two columns tell the natural boiling points of these pure liquids. And then the second column are their molal boiling point constants. So for water, which is the solvent in this problem, its molal boiling point constant is 0.51. The I value is going to be for sodium chloride. Sodium chloride NaCl dissociates into two ions. We know its I value is two. So really the only thing we have to calculate here is the molality of the solution. And we'll do that with the definition of molality. It's moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. And both those numbers are given in the problem. So it's 0 0.150 moles of NaCl per, we have to switch the 90 grams of water into kilograms, 0 0.0900 kilograms. And if you divide this out, it comes out 1.667 with the guard digit, molal of NaCl. So now we have all the data necessary to multiply out to calculate how much the boiling point of water should theoretically be changed when you dissolve the sodium chloride in it. So it's the molal boiling point constant whose units are Celsius degrees kilogram of water per mole of solute, multiplied by the molality, which I write out explicitly, 1.667 moles of solute per kilogram of water. So the kilograms of water cancel out, the moles of solute cancel out. And then multiply by the I value of 2, which is a ratio of moles to moles, so it has no units. And our only units come out are Celsius degrees. And our constant was a two significant figure number, so we're going to get a two significant figure answer of 1.7 Celsius degrees.
when you do this calculation, you're not calculating the new boiling point of water, you're calculating how much the boiling point of water goes up. So from handout five, you can find what the boiling point of pure water is, 100.00 degrees, and then you're gonna add to that the 1.7 degrees Celsius to get what the boiling point of the solution should be, which will be 101.7 degrees Celsius. Now, that's all well and good, but there's an actual real application for the colligative properties. And the important application is that every single colligative property can be used to calculate the molar mass of a non-volatile solute. And let me show you how that works with an example. We're gonna try to find the molar mass of a non-electrolyte if, if a solution is prepared with 4.80 grams of the non-electrolyte dissolved in 150.0 grams of carbon disulfide and it has a boiling point of 47.5 degrees Celsius. So if we're gonna to try to calculate molar mass, and we're gonna do this a lot the rest of the semester, so this concept's gonna be really important here, think about what molar mass is. The molar mass of carbon, 12.01 grams per mole. So experimentally, if you wanna know the molar mass of something, you need to measure two things or calculate two things, the grams of the material, and the moles of the material and then divide them. So if we wanna calculate the molar mass of substance X, I need to know the grams of substance X and the moles of substance X. If we're doing a non-electrolyte in this problem, well, one of those two things we can measure directly in lab. I just have to pick up a chunk of the unknown, whether it's a solid rock or whether it's crystals or whether it's actually a liquid and put it on the balance and weigh it. In this particular problem that's being described, they took this non-electrolyte they put it in a balance and determined it weighed 4.80 grams. So we're gonna know the mass of the non-electrolyte. If you wanna calculate the molar mass, what we're gonna figure out from the colligative property is how many moles of the non-electrolyte there are. In any molar mass calculation, this will be your last step, taking the measured grams of the unknown and dividing it by the calculated moles of the unknown from the colligative property. So this is a, solution whose boiling point's been measured, that means we can determine how much the boiling point's changed. We'll have to go to handout five to do that. The solvent in this case is carbon disulfide, so let's find carbon disulfide, and here's its boiling point, 46.2 degrees Celsius. This should make perfect sense now. Look at the freezing point of the solution, 47.5. It went up, so we can calculate how much the boiling point changed. It's the 47.5 minus the 46.2, 1.3 Celsius degrees. That's delta T sub B. K sub B is found on the handout right here, 2.34 for carbon disulfide. We can plug that value in. And then the I value is uh, given in the problem because they said the solute was a non-electrolyte. And I gave you a nice little hint here. I told you the I value would be one, but I'm never gonna do that again. You should know that if you have a non-electrolyte, that's something that does not dissociate or ionize into ions. And so its I value is gonna have to be one. So we know every single value in the equation except for the molality. If we're trying to calculate the moles of the solute, what I would do is rewrite molality with its definition. Molality is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. The kilograms of solvent are essentially given in the problem. They told you how many grams of the solvent you were making the solution out of, 150 grams of carbon disulfide, so we can solve for the moles of the solute, and you just isolate moles of the solute. Moving everything else over to the left side, the moles of the solute will be the kilograms of solvent multiplied by the change in the boiling point divided by the molal boiling point constant and I. And so we're just gonna plug the numbers in. The kilograms of the carbon disulfide, moving the decimal point three places over, give us 0 0.1500. The change in the boiling point, 1.3 Celsius degrees. Looking up the boiling point constant, 2.34 Celsius degrees kilogram per mole, and the I value is one. Everything cancels out except for moles of solute. So therefore, in order to have the boiling point of the solution raised from 46.2 up to 47.5, there had to be 0 0.0833 moles of solute in it. We can absolutely figure that out because this is a colligative property and the change in the boiling point only depends upon the number of solute particles, not what they are. So once we've calculated what the number of moles of the non-electrolyte solute are, we just take the grams of the non-electrolyte, 
divide it by the moles of the non-electrolyte, and that'll give us the molar mass, and we can determine that this substance uh, must have a molar mass of 58 grams per mole. So that's uh, how to calculate the boiling point of a solution and then the utility of boiling point elevations, how they can be used to calculate a molar mass of an unknown solute. The third colligative property is freezing point depression. And it turns out that any time you dissolve something in a liquid, a liquid's freezing point is always lowered when it has a non-volatile solute dissolved in it. To understand why this is, let's go back to the definition of freezing point. If you have a liquid and a solid, and let's take water and ice, and they're at zero degrees Celsius, that's the freezing point. Why is that? Because that's the temperature where the equilibrium vapor pressure of liquid water exactly equals the equilibrium vapor pressure of ice. So the definition of a freezing point or melting point, you could say it either way, is whatever temperature allows the EVP of its liquid to equal the EVP of its solid. And for water, that happens at zero degrees Celsius. Now, let's see what happens when we dissolve a solute into the water. With solute particles dissolved in the water, what should happen is the equilibrium vapor pressure of the liquid should be lowered. That was an important consideration in understanding boiling point elevation, and it's an important consideration in understanding freezing point depression. So I'm going to wind up putting a bunch of solute particles in the liquid, and that's going to lower the rate of evaporation. Some of the vapor will condense, and we'll wind up having a lower vapor pressure. The reason for that is the solute particles block spots on the surface and decrease the rate of evaporation. So therefore condensation is happening at a faster rate and some of the vapor condenses out. And now I have less vapor in here. And if the vapor pressure is less, it's not gonna be the same as that as the solid. So at zero degrees, this solution is not at its freezing point. So the only way only when the temperature decreases can you get the equilibrium vapor pressure of the liquid to again equal the equilibrium vapor pressure of the solid. So watch what happens as we lower the temperature. If you lower the temperature, you're actually going to lower the vapor pressures of both the solid and the liquid solution. So that'll decrease and that'll decrease. But it looks like the amount of vapor in both containers is not quite the same yet, so that's not the new melting point. Let's lower it down to negative two. Vapor pressure decreases, vapor pressure decreases. Now they're the same. So this is now the new freezing point of the solution, negative two degrees. So therefore, the freezing point of the solution is now lower than the freezing point of the solvent. If we want to look at this concept graphically, here's once again the curve or the graph for equilibrium vapor pressure of water at a variety of different temperatures. And to show how this works, I'm going to have to draw on here also the graph for the equilibrium vapor pressure of ice. When I do that, I want you to notice something about this. It's always true for solids. Their equilibrium vapor pressure curves are way steeper than that for liquids. So the ice and the liquid water curve cross right there at that dot. So that's the point where the equilibrium vapor pressure of ice equals the equilibrium vapor pressure of water. That's the freezing point. If you dissolve something in the water, you lower the pure water's vapor pressure, so the blue curve is going to change to the green curve. And so now, where on this green curve are you going to have a new freezing point? It has to be where the freezing point of the water, uh, where the vapor pressure of the water solution equals the vapor pressure of the ice, and that's going to be, and I missed it by a, just a tad, but it's right here where they should be the same, right there. And if you go to that point, that's going to be the new freezing point of the solution, which is always going to therefore be lower than the freezing point of liquid water. So solutions always have lower freezing points than the liquid that they're made from, the pure solvent itself. So if we want to determine the decrease in the freezing point from a solvent to a solution, it's going to be proportional again to the concentration of the solute particles. And so I'm going to change this to an equality by replacing the proportionality sign with an equal sign and a constant. The concentration of the solute will be measured by molality, and then we're going to multiply by the Van Hoff factor in case the electrolyte dissociates or ionizes into ions. So the colligative property equation for freezing point depression is almost identical to that for boiling point elevation. It's delta T sub F, which is the decrease in freezing point, equals K sub F, which is the molal freezing point constant. So every liquid will have its own boiling point constant, will have its own freezing point constant. They're going to be different from each other. M is still going to be the molality, 
and I is going to still be the Van Hoff factor. So with this in mind, maybe we can do a calculation now and we're going to see if we can find the freezing point of a solution that is prepared with 0 0.150 moles of calcium chloride dissolved in 97.0 grams of water. If you want to pause the recording for a couple minutes and try this on your own and then turn it back on, then we can go through the answers. We can see how successful you were at using this colligative property equation. So to calculate the new freezing point of the solution, we're going to first determine the change in the freezing point, which will be the freezing point constant times molality times I. You will need handout five to do this because you will need to look up the freezing point constant for water. So here is water, boiling point, boiling point constant, freezing point, freezing point constant, 1.86 Celsius degrees kilogram per mole. The I value for this particular solute, it's calcium chloride, that's formula is CaCl2, so that would dissociate into three ions, the I value is three, so the only thing you really have to calculate here is the molality. So that's gonna be the moles of the calcium chloride divided by the kilograms of water. That's gonna equal 1.546 molal. And now to calculate the change in the freezing point, we use the freezing point constant, 1.86 multiply it by the molality, 1.546, and then multiply it by the counted number of ions that calcium chloride dissociates into, so that's not used for significant figure determination, it's just a counted number three, and the kilograms will cancel out, the moles will cancel out, our answer will come out in Celsius degrees, we get 8.63 Celsius degrees. So this is not the freezing point of the solution, this is the change in the freezing point of the solution. Now you go back to handout five, and you make sure you look up and see what the natural freezing point of the solvent is, water's freezing point is zero, you've calculated how much the freezing point goes down. So the actual freezing point will be zero minus 8.63, which turns out to be negative 8.63 degrees Celsius. This phenomenon is used quite a bit on the East Coast where it snows a lot. And it's really hard to drive around on roads that are iced. And so what people do on the East Coast is they sprinkle sodium chloride or calcium chloride on the roads. And what that does is it dissolves in any water that's on the roads, lowering the freezing point. If the freezing point's lowered, that means you're more likely to be driving on wet liquid as opposed to solid ice, keeping the driver safer. And that's why you hear people talking about salting roads. Now, we can use this colligative property as well to determine the molar mass of a solute. In fact, this is what's gonna be happening in experiment 14. We're gonna to try to find the molar mass of a non-electrolyte if a solution is prepared with 10.0 grams of the non-electrolyte dissolved in 78.0 grams of benzene and has a freezing point of 3.5 degrees Celsius. So, Anytime you're calculating molar mass, once again, what is molar mass equal? Think about its units, grams per mole. You need to know experimentally the mass of the substance and divide it by the quantity of the substance. So we need to know how many grams of X there are divided by moles of X. So when you're calculating the molar mass of a material and you're gonna dissolve it in a liquid and measure its freezing point, you're going to have to measure its mass on a balance. And in this problem, they weighed out 10.0 grams of the non-electrolytes, so we know the numerator. You're going to have to figure out the denominator. It's always that way. So this is what we're going to do at the very end of the calculation. The colligative property allows you to calculate what the moles of the non-electrolyte are. So here we go. The equation is delta T sub F equals K sub F times M times I. Here's handout five. Our particular solvent is benzene. So let's locate benzene on there. Boiling point, boiling point constant, freezing point, freezing point constant. So the freezing point of benzene is 5.5 degrees. It says the freezing point of the solution is 3.5 degrees, so we can calculate the change in the freezing point. If you subtract these, that comes out 2.0. We know delta T sub F. The K sub F for benzene is located on the chart as well, and that value is 5.12 Celsius degrees kilogram per mole. The I value you can tell because it describes the, not, the solute as a non-electrolyte. And that's really easy to determine experimentally. We did that in a previous experiment. You dissolve the non-electrolyte in a solution and you stick a couple of electrodes in it and see if the solution conducts electricity. If it doesn't, it must be a non-electrolyte. And if it's a non-electrolyte, the I value is one. 
So the only thing we have to solve for is molality. And anytime you're trying to solve for molar mass, it's always best to rewrite molality as moles per kilogram. More specifically, it's moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. And the kilograms of solvent we can determine because they told us we made the solution with 78.0 grams of benzene. So that's 0 0.0780 kilograms. So solve this for the moles of the solute. And we're going to plug all the numbers into the left side. 0 0.0780 kilograms of benzene was a 2.0 Celsius degree temperature change. The constant that we looked up, 5.12 Celsius degrees kilograms of benzene per mole of solute. And then the Van Hoff factor, the counted number one. Units cancel out except for moles. And therefore, this solution must have contained 0 0.0305 moles of this non-electrolyte, whatever it is. So once you've calculated the number of moles, now we go back to the final step. We calculate molar mass by taking the grams of the non-electrolyte, which we weighed out at the beginning of the experiment, divided by the moles of the non-electrolyte we just calculated. The units are grams per mole. That's your molar mass. And the denominator was only two significant figures. So we wind up getting a molar mass that's two significant figures, 330 grams per mole.